world is going to hell in a handbasket. <laughs> Have you ever heard that? Yep. It's true that we are facing challenging times. And to be honest, they're going to become more challenging in the days and years to come. You pay attention to the news, you will see that we have problems. We have economic problems. We have social problems. And do we ever have spiritual issues? It seems to me that people are rejecting God more today than in decades gone by. To say that there is turmoil in the Middle East is an understatement at best. We hear more and more of earthquakes, tornadoes, hurricanes, diseases that are incurable, AIDS, and now we had the Ebola, Ebola, religious persecution is on the rise. Politicians seem to be less and less sincere, making one bad decision after another. And I'd like to be able to stand before you this morning and say, everything is going to get better. But I honestly don't know that. If we are living in the last days, as many believe that we are, the Bible says that these things will happen. So we shouldn't be surprised if things get worse. Now I'm not trying to be Debbie Downer, doom and gloom. And you might be saying, well, Pastor, you got a pretty good start. Yeah, <laughs> no, I'm trying to just share some biblical truths. In the last days, it does say that things will get worse. In the last days, it does say that we'll have these issues and more. And if we understand the times that we're living in, and we see things getting worse and worse, and we see sin running rampant, understanding what's going on will help us not to let it get under our skin. Because in the midst of all this, we are still called to have peace. Amen. We are still called to have joy. So we cannot get wrapped up in how things look. We cannot get wrapped up in how bad things seem to be. Christianity is a culture inside of a culture. Though a thousand may fall at my one side and ten thousand at my right, no evil shall come nigh me. Amen? Amen. Amen. So even though it looks like doom and gloom for we who are believers, it does not have to be doom and gloom for us personally. Amen. These things will come to pass. We will see these things in the news and so forth. Matter of fact, news bulletin, news flash, sinners are going to sin. Why do we think they're going to be transformed outside of Christ? Sinners are going to do what they do. And hopefully the righteous will do what they're supposed to be doing. Amen? That's true. Amen. You say, well, aren't we all sinners? No, we're not all sinners. We were all sinners, but we were saved by the grace of God. We are now the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, we take on the attributes of our Father and we produce the fruit of the Spirit. Amen. So whatever the world's doing, it really has nothing to do with us. I have a choice to make. I can get hot under the collar about what's going on in this world and I can lose my peace because of all the ungodliness that's going on around me that I see. Or I can look at all of this as an opportunity. It can be an obstacle in our lives, in our Christian walk, or it can be an opportunity in our Christian walk. When does light shine the brightest? When it's the darkest, amen? And so the darker we see things getting around us, the brighter 
we can shine. Therefore, instead of just getting all mad about it, we can say, you know, I'm going to show Jesus. I'm going to let Jesus shine through me. This uh, little light of mine, yeah. I'm going to let it shine. You know, when it's pure darkness, it doesn't take much of a light at all to, to be seen. Amen? That's true. And we need to let our light shine in the midst of the darkness. Now, let me just say this. I'm not saying that we should throw in the towel. I'm not saying that we should quit praying. Uh, I'm not saying we should not do our civic duties. You know, we should vote. We should stand up for righteousness politically and all of that. But do not put your trust in what you can do in the natural. We should not get overwhelmed with what's going on around us. And I see that happening a lot with Christians. You look on Facebook and people just get overwhelmed with what's going on. Again, Christianity is a culture within a culture. And we need to live in our culture, let our shine for the other culture to see. You know, we can write our letters. We can make our phone calls. We can... Uh, March, we can vote in new politicians and all of that, but that's not going to make the problem go away. That just puts a band aid. Because the Word of God says in the latter days, these things will happen. If, we're really, if we really want to bring change, what we must do is we must pull people out of the darkness that they live in and bring them into the light of God's love and the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the only way we're going to bring changes to expand our culture, which will decrease the culture around us. But we're never going to change the world. But we can, if we can't change the world, who are we going to change? Us. Amen? If we fight only the natural, we're going to become more and more discouraged, and even bitter. As we look at what's going on, I mean, there's been a moral decline that I've never seen in my lifetime. The moral fiber of our society is decaying right before our very eyes. You need only turn the TV on. And you can see a sampling of the decadent behavior of society. We have abortion on demand. We have same-sex marriage that you can't even question or you're labeled a bigot. We have adultery that's common. We have drunkenness and so on. They may not get any better, especially if we are living in the last days. But we do not have to let it rob us of our peace. We can have peace even though the world's going in the direction that it's going. Now, we can pray for these fellow human beings and instead of viewing them as enemies, understand they are deceived in need of a relationship with our Lord, Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Sometimes it's easy to just get mad at the people, but we've got to realize they're just pawns. They're just being deceived. Our, our fight is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, mights and dominions. Amen? Amen. In 2 Timothy, chapter 3, I'm going to read to you kind of what we've been talking about here. It reads in 2 Timothy 3, beginning with verse 1, But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, bolsters, proud, blasphem blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, halting, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof, and from such people turn away. I'm going to take just a few moments. We're not going to be long today. But I just want to walk down some of these. First, it says perilous times. That can either be translated troubled times or even dangerous times. 
I, re I realize that we many times judge the Bible what's going on in America. When in fact, America has very little to do with Bible prophecy. Most Bible prophecy deals with the Middle East and where does the attention turn today? We, we hear more about the Middle East than we've heard about in my lifetime. I mean, it's a common everyday uh, uh, subject today. No doubt there's always been unrest in the Middle East. There's always been the persecution of Christians in the Middle East. But obviously, it is increasing and on the rise today. I know Mike and Kay and Ron and Bev have been going to some seminars and they've learned a lot. Uh, concerning the Middle East. And uh, I've read uh, some books about it and, and have a little understanding about it. And in church, uh, you, you want to talk about prophecy being fulfilled right before our very eyes. It doesn't take long to figure it out. In America, we're beginning to see those that are living for God and those that are practicing righteousness are called bigots or at the very least intolerant. Well, on the other hand, those uh, uh, who are living what the Bible declares as a sinful lifestyle are being celebrated. And unfortunately, that's even sinking into the church. He goes on to say, Timothy, lovers of money. We are called to worship God, love people, and use money. But society has gotten that turned around to where we worship things, love money, and use people. And as we look at verses 2 through 5, we'll see the parallels between what we read and the newspaper or the evening news. You really can't tell the difference. He goes on to say, lovers of self. Well, what does that mean, selfish? Looking out for number one. You know, today if you go to a modern psychologist and you have issues, I'll tell you, you just need to take care of you. You look out after number one. Whatever it takes, you come out on top. That's a selfish attitude. As a matter of fact, Philippians 2 and verse 3, it reads, Let nothing be done through selfish ambition, or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, listen to this part, let each esteem others better than himself. In other words, instead of trying to get that best seat, would you like this seat? Esteeming others higher than yourself, better than yourself. That does not mean to make yourself a doormat for everybody to walk on, but what it does mean is to consider others. Consider their feelings. Consider their comfort. Then he goes on to say, bolsters. They brag about what they have and what they've done. See, that's, that's all the world. Society is just about get to the top. So they can accumulate all these possessions and all this money and all this power, which is opposite of what God's called us to. There's nothing wrong with being wealthy, but we need to use that wealth for His glory. Amen. And if God says do something with it, do what He says. You know, we need to be like Paul. Instead of being a bolster, we need to say, if I boast, I boast in the Lord Jesus Christ. If I boast, I say, you know, all that I have, all that I can do, I only have and I can only do it because of what He's done for me. Give God the glory. Give God the credit. Then he goes on to say, proud. The verse comes to me that uh, we're not to think of ourselves more highly than we ought to. You know, we're nothing without Him. And in John 15 and verse 5, Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. It's all about being connected to Him. 
You know, what the world considers a success and what God considers a success is not always the same thing. In God's eyes, success can be summed up in one word, and that's obedience. Then he goes on to say, blasphemers. They speak, they speak evil of God and God's people. I, I, I tell you, I just get shocked sometimes when I read articles, like at the newspaper, and there's an article about God or, or something. The, 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 the blasphemers that come out of the woodwork, and they just blaspheme God, and you're a bunch of idiots for believing in such nonsense, and, and they just want to slam God. Blasphemers. I'm seeing more and more of that. And that's here in America. That's even in the Bible Belt. We're not talking about in California. We're not talking about over in the Middle East. We're talking about right here. Disobedient to parents. By and large, discipline is a lost art. Children are disobedient and dis disrespectful to their parents and church if they don't respect their parents how do we expect them to act in society unthankful we see this all the time many in society believe that or many believe that society owes them a living they're not grateful for what they have in contrast the Bible tells us that God's people are to be thankful. And we'll probably be talking a lot about thankfulness in, in, in November. Because <laughs> that's when we all get thankful, isn't it? Yeah. You'll see your you know, 25 reasons I'm thankful. And, no, it, it doesn't need to happen just in November. Amen. We need to be thankful year-round. We need to be like Paul. I'm, I'm content in all things. In abundance or in lack. It doesn't mean that we're to be satisfied or settled, but we're to be content. Amen. Unholy. No regard for decency. No shame. You can't watch a Hardee's commercial. Yeah. Man. They're pretty much like a, what we used to call X-rated shows. I mean, if we're watching television, the hardest commercial comes on, i got to look up at the ceiling. <laughs> Close my ears. Hardies! is nothing sacred. Men hold nothing to sacred any longer. Unloving or without natural affection. I like to call this dysfunctional families to the extreme. And in the original, this has to do with the family. I'm not going to take time to break that down, but it's in reference to the family. And I think about that and, and what we see in the news today. Abandonment. Abuse. Abortion. Infidelity. Incest. We read about people on purpose leaving their babies in a car to die a terrible, horrible death. What kind of parent can do that? Just the other day, they found five dead children, I think, in somebody's backyard where the dad killed them. In, in the past, we read about where the mother drove her car into a river, ocean, well, ocean, and before that, there was one in, in the river with like four or five kids in the car. Unloving. Without natural, I mean, that's just natural affection. But they don't have it. And we could go on. Unforgiveness. Slanderers. Here's a good one. Without self-control. That's a biggie today. Now, 
my position on drinking is the Bible doesn't say you can't have a beer. The Bible doesn't say you can't have a glass of wine. My position is it's not necessary and it can be dangerous. But I'm not going to judge you for that. But I'll tell you what I will judge you for. So what I will judge you, but the Bible says don't get drunk for one thing. So if you're doing that, you're being disobedient. And secondly, if you get drunk and get behind the wheel of a vehicle, I'll judge you for that. I judge you stupid. With all the talk, when you've seen the consequences, but people have no self-control. People don't have any self-control with the words they use. Despisers of good. I mean, I, it, here to, I mean, I know a lot of this has gone on in different places, but right here in America, in the Bible Belt, people despise good. You're called names. It goes back to that verse, you're calling that which is evil good and that which is good evil. Despisers of good. Traitors. Here's a good one. Headstrong. I mean, look at our politicians today. Not just politicians, but all the followers. Haughty. And I'll say the best for last, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. I'd rather go out and please myself than to please God. You know, we, we put God down at the very bottom. You know, we're going to do all the things we want to do, all the things that are fun to us. Then maybe, if I have some time left, I'll give God some time. Okay. I said all that. And up to this point, maybe it's not been very encouraging. But sometimes we just got to look at the raw truth. And here's the point. We can't make it, we can't let it make us mad. We can't let it make us bitter. We can't let it rob us of our peace. In the midst of all that's going on, we can still have joy. Unspeakable and full of glory. We can still have a peace that passes understanding. Church, there are some countries in this world that are going through way more than we go through. I mean, we are blessed to be able to come here this morning. This is a privilege to come here and worship together this morning. Freely, without fear. We're in some places they're putting their very lives at stake to meet together to worship God. They're putting their very lives on the line to read a Bible or for someone to find a Bible in their possession. We are still very fortunate here in America. Amen. Let's not be lovers of self more than lovers of God. We're not going to change the world. So who are we going to change? Ourselves. Amen. Amen. So do we see these situations as obstacles? Or do we see them as opportunities? That will change your whole outlook. When you go through life and you see all this ungodliness unfolding before you. If you say, you know, I'm so mad at what they're doing. I can't believe they're getting by with that. I can't and your blood pressure goes up and you start steaming. And that's not really going to help any. But if you just stay at peace and say, you know, I love God. And I love these people. I'm going to be a light that they can see that will point them to Jesus. So we can get all bent out of shape. We can complain and we can throw a fit. We, but, or we can make a choice to be a light in a dark world. We can talk about how the world, how bad the world is, 
or we can talk about how good God is. I choose to exalt God in the midst of the darkness. And church, the good news is this. We can still do it without being thrown in prison. We can still do it without facing execution. Let's take advantage of it, amen? Let's really be a light. Yes, it's bad. Yes, we should pray. Yes, we should again do our civic duty. But beyond all that, let's glorify God. Let's be a light shining and pointing people to Him. Pointing people to the Gospel. And in the, I tell you, there, there's no greater joy than bringing people out of darkness into light. There's no greater joy than leading somebody to the saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. In Proverbs, it tells us, He that win, winneth souls is wise. I'll tell you this, He that win, winneth souls is blessed. Happy. There's nothing greater than to realize that by your sharing the good news of Jesus Christ, somebody has been transferred out of darkness into light. Their eternity will no longer be an eternity of damnation, but it will be an eternity in glory with God. So, I challenge you this week to be a light. Even though you hear all the bad stuff, don't just get caught up and argue. and Just lift Jesus up. Amen? Magnify Him. Exalt Him. Draw people. Lift up His name and He will draw people to Himself. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Hallelujah. Father, we thank You again for Your goodness. We thank You for Your love and mercy. And Lord, we do know that we live in dark times. But Lord, we know that You have provided light for us. And Lord, not only that, but You have made us light. So Lord, I pray that as we leave this place today, Lord, as we go out into our workplaces, we go out into our schools, into our neighborhood, wherever it may be, Lord, I just pray that you would lead us and guide us by your Holy Spirit to be a light for you and your kingdom. Lord, I pray that you would give us divine opportunities to share the good news of Jesus Christ. I pray, Lord, that you would give us wisdom to know what to say. And, Father, that you would give us the courage to say it. And, Lord, we're careful to give you the praise and the glory for all that you do. And right now, everybody, just to look at me. You know, I can assume that you all have a relationship with Jesus Christ, and sometimes I do. But I always want to say this. If you're not certain, if you're not certain that you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you can be certain today. Amen? Amen. He's provided a way of salvation. That name is Jesus Christ. And if you will accept Him as your Lord and Savior, you can know that He is your Lord and Savior. You can know that heaven is your home. And you can have peace today in the midst of all that's going on. You can have peace. And I'm just going to ask, is there anybody that cannot say for certain that you want to know today? Just lift your hand and say, that's me. That's me. Anybody at all? Perhaps you mean you want me to lift my hand? and say that in front of everybody here. You know, we just watched that movie uh, Friday Night, God's Not Dead. And, uh, you know, one of the scriptures in there, if you, you know, based, I'm going to paraphrase, but if you acknowledge Him before men, He will acknowledge you before the Father. If you deny Him before men, He will deny you before the Father. So if you have never accepted Christ, and you raise your hand, what you're saying is, I acknowledge Him as my Lord and Savior. It might be the first time you did that, but once you do it, you keep doing it. Amen? I mean, it's an ongoing thing. You see, I have no shame whatsoever standing before you and saying, I acknowledge the Lord Jesus Christ as my Savior. And that's all I'm asking you to do is to acknowledge Him as your Lord and Savior. If anybody that hasn't done that that would like to do that today, just lift your hand. I'm going to pray for you and you can know that you are a child of God. Anybody at all before we move on? 
Let me just say this. How many acknowledge Him as your Lord and Savior? Amen? Praise God. That's awesome, isn't it? That means one thing for sure. I'm going to see you in heaven. You know, I mean, who knows what might happen in the next 20 years. But one thing I do know, that when I get to heaven and you get to heaven, we're going to see each other there, amen? And what a day that'll be. I love that song, what a day that'll be when my Jesus I shall see when I look upon His face, the one who saved me by His grace. Hallelujah. God's awesome. Amen? Amen. God bless you. And uh, if not before, we'll see you soon.